I often wonder why I have so much passion for exploring this great province by boat. I'm not sure what the attraction is, the 29,000 kilometers of coastline, the 300 resettled communities, or the hundreds of bays and harbors. I am captivated by her beauty and her spirit. The landscapes are crisp and clean. The people are welcoming and warm, unlike the weather. I do know that I have been sailing these rugged coasts for 27 summers, and it never gets old. To step ashore where the Dorset Paleo Eskimos, Vikings, Europeans, and fellow Newfoundlanders and Labradorians have walked gets me excited. Where once they stood, we stand. We love thee, windswept land. Newfoundland and Labrador tourism puts it simply. No matter where you find yourself in Newfoundland and Labrador, you'll feel very, very far away. This place does this to you. It sweeps you off your feet and keeps you there as long as you want. In 2019, my sailing trip took me to the wild and beautiful Northern Peninsula and Southern Labrador. This is part one of a two-part video of my 2019 cruise. I hope you feel the beauty and the emotion that I have experienced. So come and discover these hidden gems of Newfoundland and Labrador. For the period of 1783 to 1904, the French shore was fished from Cape St. John to Cape Ray on the southwest coast of Newfoundland. The east coast of the Great Northern Peninsula is part of the French shore and is a cruiser's paradise. The French refer to this area as Le Petit Nord. My track along this portion of the French shore was approximately 130 nautical miles. It's a little more challenging than Notre Dame Bay or Bonavista Bay, but surprisingly it offers so many choices for exploring and hiking. The mountainous terrain and its isolation can be intimidating, but its beauty cannot be surpassed. The historical depth of the area is impressive. You can feel the history as you walk along the shores or zigzag through the cemeteries and long deserted homes. Williamsport, located 13 and a half nautical miles southwest of Anglie, was a French fishing station up until about 1870. Williamsport is known for its whaling factory, which was first established in 1945. It closed in 1951 with employment of 188. With its quickly deepening shoreline and mountains on three sides, it makes funneling, accelerating winds the norm. I thought long and hard about going ashore, but as this was my second visit, I could not accept failure. I threw out two anchors and hoped for the best. On my return, the main Bruce anchor did drag, so I was pleased with my decision to lay the second anchor. And success, I managed to get some drone footage and photos. In 1967, it was re-established and processed 1,248 whales for a five-year period ending in 1972. The federal government placed a moratorium on whaling in 72, and as a result, the station ceased operations. Its population was 15 at the time. Back in the 80s, I had spent a short time in Conch. I was diving with the Newfoundland Marine Archaeology Society looking for a second French shipwreck that was sunk in the early 1700s. I always wanted to return, and finally in 2019 I did, but this time by boat. It's always interesting to sail into a community rather than drive. 
It's the way our Newfoundland and Labrador communities should be viewed. Conch is a toddy town, population 170. Lawns are well groomed and the homes are well cared for. Conch has a long history with the French and British. In fact, Conch was identified on a 1613 map that was based on Champlain's voyage of 1612. It has been an active port throughout its history. In 1786, Conch and Carouge, now northeast and southwest Kraus, harbored as many as 22 French ships with over 2,000 fishing servants. I am sure it had to be a very boisterous community at the time. Conch is the custodian of information for the French shore. Lots can be learned at its interpretation center. Of particular note is the 217-foot French tapestry, which was designed by Jean-Claude Roy and stitched by a group of dedicated individuals. It tells the history of the French shore and its people. It's been my belief that cruising our Newfoundland and Labrador coastline will always be surprised. You will always discover the unexpected and you will always be amazed. My stops in Croke and Fishet Islands literally took the wind out of my sails. I had no concept of what I would experience. I thought Croke was a resettled community and Fishet Islands, well, just no clue. I was a townie out of his element. Croke is a community of 51, which has an impressive history with a well-maintained French and English cemetery and grave sites dating from the 1700s. Carved in the cliffs in a cove not far from the main community are the names and the origins of French ships that visited in the 1800s. Croke was one of the principal fishery stations along the Petit Nord. In 1640, it was decreed that Croke was to be a place of registration for the French ships fishing here. In the mid-19th century, Croke was also used as the headquarters station for the French warships employed in protecting the French fisheries. While the weather did not cooperate, the waterfront properties were indeed stunning. The cod fishery was underway, so the stages and stores had the look of an active fishery, just like the days before the cod moratorium. This fond gentleman offered me a fish. Not only that, he cleaned and filleted it for me. I was so very thankful for his kindness that night. My next port of call was Fishet Islands. Wow, wow, wow. Did I say wow? It was a tricky harbor to enter. It was windy, foggy, and wet. The anchorage was shallow as shoals in the vicinity of where I dropped the hook. The Encyclopedia of Newfoundland and Labrador describes Fishet Island's entrance as narrow and tortuous. I was feeling the starkness and the loneliness of the place as I entered. Fishet's Island Harbor has been a favorite of the French and the Newfoundland fishermen for the last four centuries. The harbour has appeared on French maps since 1547. In 1640, Fishet and Carpoon harbours were listed as the largest on the Petit Nord, with a capacity of 350 men. The summer activity on these small islands was indeed impressive. In 1766, it had a combined British and French fishery of 60 boats. 
two vessels reported producing 305,000 kilograms of fish. In the middle 19th century, fish had moved from a French fishing station to a fixed settlement populated by Newfoundland, Irish, and English fishermen. In 1857, there were 37 people. The French had eight fishing rooms, 60 boats, and 430 men. It must have been an incredibly lively place with such an international mix. Since returning home and having had an opportunity to do a little research, I understand why I could feel the grasp of the spirits here. One man, one boat, and the spirits of the deserted homes and sheds. I spent one day and night here, but needed three or four days to do justice to this very special place. It's spring 2020, and I'm finalizing the video of last summer's sailing trip. The pictures, video clips, and research remind me how wonderfully diverse and intriguing this part of Newfoundland is. If you are a photographer, historian, archeologist, diver, geologist, hiker, mariner, and the list can go on, then this is where you need to be. I know I'll be back. What about you? <laughs>